Hello, and welcome to Sanditon FanCast. We are a fan-created podcast about everyone's fave masterpiece show, Sanditon. I'm Michelle. I live in the States. You can find me at Musings on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm Rita. I live in England. I'm at Annoying Rita on Instagram and Twitter. And welcome to our podcast on the second episode of season three. Before we begin today, we want to say a big thank you to everyone who reached out to us to welcome us back to our second season. And quick favor, if you're liking the show, please give us a rate or review to help us bring more people into this very dysfunctional little family we've got going here. <laughs> Okay, so let's begin the show as usual with a recap. Alrighty. The episode began with Charlotte romantically brooding in some sand dunes. How very pole dark of her. And a voiceover of a letter from Ralph conveniently lets us know that he has gone home to Willingdon and left her behind to suck face with Mr. Carl. I mean, to help Georgiana. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's what she's there to do. In town, Arthur is overseeing the preparations for a music recital to welcome the king's arrival in Sanditon. He naturally seeks out Lady Susan's advice on what his majesty would most enjoy and explains he has engaged the celebrated American soprano, Miss Elizabeth Greenhorn. We then head to the Parker residence. Tom and Mary are lamenting that the Lord Chancellor appointed to hear Georgiana's case, is a piece of shit that's anti-abolitionist. All the lawyers they have approached on her behalf won't touch the case with a barge pole. Edward is raking leaves in the churchyard, and I've put this in quotation marks because the dude is actually just sitting on his ass. <laughs> um, and he makes a good show of working when Ren Reverend Hankins arrives. Bizarrely, he begs to be let off work for the day so that he can write a confessional poem and unburden his soul. Even more bizarrely, Hankins agrees. <laughs> what? Oh. Charlotte meets Georgiana in the tea rooms. They discuss the upcoming trial. Even without a lawyer, Georgiana vows not to give up. She also wonders at what evidence Lockhart is intending to produce, but doubts it's truthful. After all, Lockhart is a known liar. As they're talking, a loud, Miss Hayward! is yelled from across the room. It's Leonora who rushes towards Charlotte. Behind her are Alexander and Augusta. Colborne apologises for interrupting them, but is clearly happy to see that Charlotte is still in town. He and the girls are shown to a table beside the pair, and for the rest of the scene, he quite rudely eavesdrops <laughs> on their entire conversation. <laughs> not That's even subtly. He is not <laughs> listening to anything his kids are saying, just like... Mm -mm. Charlotte promises she'll stay until everything is resolved, and suggests Georgiana writes an open letter to some prominent newspapers detailing her iniquity. Over in their parlor, Lady Montrose is advising her son to refrain from courting Georgiana, as there are rumors that she will soon be penniless. Oh, how the turn tables. Uh, Lord Montrose refuses, as it would be rather unchivalrous to abandon her in her time of need. Lady Montrose laments this, but perks up again at the mention of Lydia's plans to go riding with Mr. Colborne that day. At least one of her children has prospects. The Colburn family leave the tea room. Augusta feigns turning back for a glove she forgot. Instead, she meets Sir Edward behind a pillar and makes it clear she saw him looking at her through the window for the past 20 minutes. Creepy. So uh, she asks what he wants. He begs for her opinion on his poetry. Bit presumptuous, given that he hasn't written anything yet. She says she has a feeling his poetry will be mawkish and wanders off. Back at a Hayrick Park, Colborne immediately changes into his riding clothes and abruptly announces he's departing for London. He hopes to be back tomorrow. After he leaves, Lady Montrose and Lydia arrive for their horse riding date. Leo and Augusta try their very best to scare them off by being as unruly as possible. Lydia seems to find them amusing, but her mother hustles them out of there as soon as possible. Back in town, Lord Montrose 
happens upon Arthur planning his big party and asks if he knows whether Georgiana is receiving visitors. Protective as ever, Arthur warns him off and explains that he has no time to talk to him. He has lots to prepare, including the arrival of his star, Miss Elizabeth Greenhorn. Tom meets Mr. Price to discuss the best location for the hotel they want to build. Mary suggests building it on top of the cliff overlooking the town, but as soon as she leaves, Mr. Price suggests it's a terrible idea. Think of the trek for the customers. Tom then explains that without Lady Denham's approval, the whole thing is moot. Mr. Price accepts the challenge of changing her mind. Over at Denham House, Mr. Price starts trying to sell Lady D on the idea of a grand hotel with rows of luxurious suites overlooking the sea. They could charge a king's ransom. Lady Denham remarks that he was always driven by greed, and that's why he passed her over for Jane Clifford with her 50,000 pounds. He acts shocked and exclaims that she was the one who left him at the altar. He still remembers well. Sun streaming through the stained glass window. She is like, wait, what? It was raining, and you left me. He tells her her memory is going. When he says he can build a grand hotel elsewhere, she angrily tells him that he won't, that he will build it right here on the seafront. Wow. Over at the Parkers, Georgiana reads out the letter she has composed to Charlotte and Mary. Why is this man to be believed over a woman of integrity? Is it because he's a white man? If so, how is that justice? Alexander then arrives with his brother Samuel Colborne, a lawyer who has agreed to take on her case. Samuel tells Georgiana that he believes she can and should win, and he offers to meet her later at Hayrick Park. Augusta can't even read a book in her backyard without being interrupted by Edward now. He says he's there to apologise for being a shitty poet. He has failed to produce anything worth reading. She's right, all of it was just mawkish. Augusta snaps at him. She is no fool and understands his interest in her is due to her large inheritance. She begs him to stop the false and rather piteous flattery. When he questions her use of piteously, <laughs> piteous, she patronisingly tells him the definition. It means deserving of pity and saunters off. He then goes home and begins penning probably a terrible poem. Yeah. Terrible. Back... <laughs> Back at the unraked entrance to the church, Hankins hands his sister a letter from London. Obviously curious, he sort of loiters, waiting for her to open it. When she doesn't, he leaves and Beatrice rips open the letter from Dr. Fox. Or Fuchs. He details listening to an open heart through a tube. It's all rather gross, but Beatrice clings to that letter as if he wrote the most exquisitely romantic poem ever. Well, they say there's a shoe for every foot. <laughs> Lady Montrose spots Lady Susan in the sanity tea room and tells her children that the latest gossip has it that the king has found a new, younger favorite. Lady Susan has now been discarded like an old shoe. Arthur runs into the tea room and begs Lady Susan for help. He's just received a letter that the king will no longer be attending that evening's concert. This is news to Lady Susan, who in that moment realizes she has been usurped, and she puts on a brave face and announces that there is nothing to be done if the king has found another form of entertainment. Ugh. Tom is meeting again with Mr. Price. He points out on a map the new location for the Grand Hotel. It's just behind the sea wall. They would have to knock down the houses where the fishermen live. Tom looks worried, but doesn't tell him to fuck off. When Mary arrives home and learns of this plan, she's like, these are people's homes. It would be unscrupulous to build on them. Tom tells her not to worry. Lady Denham would never agree, so he doesn't have to stand up to anyone. <laughs> How convenient. Arthur is looking wistfully at the sea, tears in his eyes. <laughs> Harry Montrose asks him what's wrong. Arthur tries to blow him off, but the body language is giving devastating catastrophe and to pretend otherwise is laughable. Arthur explains that the king has cancelled 
and that when Miss Greenhorn finds out, she'll refuse to perform. The whole thing will be extremely embarrassing, not to mention expensive. Harry tries to convince Arthur that as an American, Miss Greenhorn won't know any better, and he should just style the situation out with pomp. Classic Brit. Arthur looks dubious, but has little choice but to give it a try. Georgiana arrives for her meeting with Samuel Colborn with Charlotte in tow. While Georgie meets with her lawyer, Charlotte takes a very awkward seat in the foyer with Mr. Colborn. Scenes of Samuel rudely interrogating Georgiana are intercut with Charlotte and Colborn's stilted small talk. They talk about Ralph being a farmer, Colborn's time in Bath, and the girls missing her. Just as the sexual tension becomes too much to bear, Charlotte drops her gloves and Colborn hands them to her in classic period drama style. The moment their eyes meet is filled with unspoken longing. Meanwhile, Samuel tries to prepare his client for a humiliating court process where her moral character and that of her mother's will be questioned. She becomes upset and decides she is not strong enough to endure the process. She thanks him for his time and leaves. Meanwhile, Arthur greets Miss Greenhorn and thanks her for making a detour from Paris for this occasion. She explains she usually plays much grander locations, but she couldn't resist the pull of singing for the king. Lord Montrose then shows up, decked out in full ceremonial dress for the Order of the Garter, including the silly hat and cape, not to mention the giant feather sticking out of the top. He offers to present the king to her later. Arthur, uncomfortable with this lie, hustles her away and into her rooms. Back at Casa Colborn, Samuel expresses a wish to stay in town and see a little of this newfangled Sanderton. He even encourages his notoriously reclusive brother to host a hunting party. In the background, Augusta receives a letter. She enters their room and suddenly announces she doesn't feel like attending the musical recital that night and will instead stay home. Oh, God. Pull another one, Augusta. Elsewhere, Arthur has had a full-blown morality crisis and decides he cannot bear to lie to an artiste. He barges into Miss Greenhorn's room as she's preparing to sing and tells her that the king will not be attending. She is disappointed and asks if he was ever planning on coming at all or if she has been tricked. Harry interjects and tells her that while he has no problem lying, Arthur is as honest as they come. Miss Greenhorn, who has taken a shine to Arthur, agrees to do him a solid and sing at the recital anyway. Over in Georgiana's apartment, Charlotte is, Charlotte is trying to motivate her to attend the evening's concert. Georgiana is worried people will be talking about her, but Charlotte encourages her to put on her finest dress and show those gossips she is unbowed. And you know Georgiana is going to do just that. It's recital time, and Tom is surprised to see Lady Denham arriving on the arm of Mr. Price. To be fair, the last time he saw her, she was telling him not to take a penny from the man. Now she is saying she's fully behind his plans to build a hotel beside the seawall. Tom is obviously confused, but instead of putting a halt to these plans, shakes on the deal. Bucking Tom. <sighs> Augusta secretly meets up with Edward and explains she didn't want to go to the recital and be paraded in front of a bunch of suitors, so instead she decided to meet up with a lying, manipulative loser to go for a walk. A plus life choices. <laughs> Georgiana and Charlotte arrive at the event. When Georgie runs to tell her new bestie, Lord Montrose, her plans, Charlotte goes to comfort her friend, Lady Susan. She tells her that, king or not, if he were here, she would tell him he was very foolish. And she absolutely would do that. Lady Susan smiles. Susan then offers Charlotte some advice. If Mr. Starling is indeed the man to make you truly happy, you should go to him. Charlotte tells her she must stay for Georgiana, and Lady Susan implies that that's just an excuse not to return. Uh -huh. Mr. Price and Lady Denham take their seats for the performance. They both begin to grumble, and Mr. Price remarks that he'd forgotten how entertaining she can be. 
The greatest mistake of his life was not joining her at that church on that rainy day. Lady Denham looks shocked. She realises he was totally playing her earlier. Such a little shit. <laughs> Arthur announce, announces the performance is about to begin, and Charlotte rushes to a seat only to realise she is sat next to Mr. Colborne. <laughs> Isn't that convenient? Why, hello there, forced proximity trope. Gotta love it. Miss Greenhorn then makes her entrance on the stage and announces that the king won't be making it, a, making it to the performance. She dedicates her performance to, quote, any ladies here present suffering a heartache of their own, end quote, which is like half the town. <laughs> she begins to sing Porgy Amour from The Marriage of Figaro. We get close-ups of Lady Susan looking heartbroken, Tom looking anxiously over at his wife, who he is about to disappoint, and of course, Georgiana, who is inspired and moved seeing a fellow Black woman thriving. Colborne and Charlotte, meanwhile, can barely repress the sexual tension, and their hands are slowly creeping towards each other as the singing continues. They touch, but when the performance ends, Charlotte whisks her hand away, as if suddenly remembering she is engaged, and gets up to clap. After the performance, Mr. Colborne's rather debonair brother approaches Lady Susan and introduces himself. She assumes he's heard of the gossip, but he tells her he prefers to figure people up for himself. What a fun couple. <laughs> <laughs> They're interrupted by an invigorated Georgiana who has changed her mind and now wants to play an active role in the trial. They'll leave for London tomorrow at first light. G asks Charlotte to join her. She agrees, of course, which leads Lady Susan to give her a bitch, bitch please. I know what you're doing, face. <laughs> um, and that's the end. <laughs> Brace yourself for some more fuckery next week, guys, because yes. it feels like. <laughs> The ride's just cranking up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. So what did you think of the episode? It was fun. I think mm -hmm. it felt like uh, a lot of setup, like the preparation for the trial and like introducing Samuel and things like that. I think, I mean, I mentioned in a previous podcast, but that's like my favorite kind of episodes in the show. Uh, I think because... The writing is much more character-based and less about, like, dramatic plot reveals. And, oh, my God, Sydney's married or engaged or whatever. <laughs> um, these kinds of episodes are my jam. Mm -hmm. I felt like we really got to spend a lot of time with Arthur and get to know him a little bit better, which mm -hmm. was really nice. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, we really like this show because of the characters like the plot is absolutely insane um but we really enjoy the people and um yes. it's nice to spend time getting to know them a little better yes what about you uh oh i thoroughly enjoyed it um you know it was well paced um they packed a lot into an hour um and it didn't it didn't feel rushed I guess. And I think it's because it was really covering only like a two, maybe three day time span. So they were e able to keep it really super tight. Um, so, and I'm gauging that on, you know, Colborne leaving for London, back first light. They have a meeting with Georgiana. It's and then the performance days, is that it? night. So yeah. it's basically a day, like a, yeah. a day or uh, two days. And so, you know, they were able to um, keep the pace going, which I really liked. Um, I'm not you know, sure I, how he got all the way to London and back in that amount of time. But like, it's, it's it, we're again dealing with, you know, pole dark time and getting from Cornwall to London, you know. <laughs> I think they're in it, Somerset. I bet, I in did. just a space of a couple hours. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I don't know the, uh, geography, of course. Um, but, um, you know, you would be the, the better judge of how much distance there is between, um, 
where Sanditon is based um, and London. Well, so. I th- it, it depends. He would have to, like, not sleep and change his horses every mm-hmm. couple of hours, like, mm-hmm. which just seems insane to do. Um, yeah. And he, he arrived back looking pretty fresh-faced. Yeah, I think I call bullshit on this whole, but the, the geography of this town is still a mystery to me, so what yes. do I know? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> and I also agree with you about Arthur. You mm-hmm. know, we we got much more time with him not being, you know, like a, one of the characters on the edges of things. You know, we got to to see him um respond to the events that were it was really great to see Arthur in a more active role yeah if yeah that makes sense and then we also got a bit of a bit more of an insight into Lady Susan's life it was Mm -hmm. you know I was thinking Arthur and Lady Susan have always played sort of backseat roles to their Mm -hmm. Charlotte and Georgiana um and it was nice to sort of see what was going on internally with them. Like, I feel so bad for Lady Susan. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but we'll get into that. Um, yeah. The introduction of Miss Greenhorn, I thought, was really interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How to put this? I think one of the worries going into season two and three for me was that we would only see other black characters as servants, which is Mm -hmm. not the vibe. So Mm -hmm. I was really pleased to see this character and the care with which they wrote her. She's obviously successful and wealthy in her own right, but the subtext of her conversations with Arthur was that she knew she was somewhat of a curiosity as a successful black woman. She was always very conscious of that. Um, And... The way the show exists in like the very recognizable reality of of Regency period, but it doesn't shy away from showing the racism and misogyny and homophobia in that world, but also it doesn't make the these marginalized characters' entire arcs about that one thing about them. Mm hmm. They, um, uh definitely provide uh more of a um multi-dimensional uh framework for the the characters which is which i really appreciate you know we talked about how we have been fearing that um colborn's um housekeeper is going to wind up being georgiana's mother um because she's the only black person, black woman that we've seen so far, um, you know. Um, and then we I'm have Miss Green. Worried about that now. <laughs> yeah, same here. Same here. It's kind of like, oh, okay. Um, hoping we get to see some more. <laughs> yeah, and it it's a really interesting way of having a diverse cast in a period drama because mm-hmm. you know you can go down like the Mister Malcolm's list way and just never acknowledge it or you can do something Mm -hmm. like this which is i think probably harder to walk a line of like still including people but acknowledging the hardships of their situation Mm -hmm. without making it depressing Mm -hmm. um and i went on the pbs website (laughs) Mm -hmm. and um they have a little like the secrets of sanditon thing (laughs) there This character is based on a popular black opera soloist who traveled to England and sang for Queen Victoria, which is about like 30 years after Sanderton is set. Her name was Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, not Greenhorn. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount Mm -hmm. of times they said Greenhorn this episode was like (laughs) a lot. She commanded quite a, like, I don't know. She was very, very popular. (laughs) Mm-hmm. She was born into slavery in Mississippi around 1820, um, but secured freedom edu- and education in Philadelphia. And her voice was just so astonishing. Then it opened a lot of doors into uh, a musical career. Most mm-hmm. black performers were limited to 
minstrel shows. She Mm -hmm. toured uh, the Northeast singing opera and actually made it all the way to Europe along with the other black performers, actually. And she managed Mm -hmm. to sing for the Queen at Buckingham Palace in 1854. Very cool. She was the first African-American vocalist to give a commanding performance for British royalty. You go, girl. I mean, why haven't they made a movie about that? I know, right? Why have we got like 70,000 slavery (gasps) movies and nothing about (laughs) Nothing about her. I know. I I, 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 (laughs) hate it. I hate that. <laughs> and, and this is the first time I'm hearing of it, you know, and it's, it is, you know, another example of, you know, history. Um, you know, there's always more to history than what you learn in school. Um, and, uh, you know, the, how powerful would this story be for, uh, young, um, black kids to hear? You know, along with the Harriet Tubmans and the Rosa Parks and and that. So, anyhow, you go, Miss Greenfield. We're just going to greenlight this movie if we yeah. can get it done. Yeah, come on. Um, as soon as she came on screen, I was like, this has to be based on history. They wouldn't just pull yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. How is your knowledge of opera in general? Uh, pretty dismal. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, probably the musical genre that I know the least about. Um, I am familiar with the marriage of Figaro because I, I went through my Mozart, um, fangirl phase, uh, when the movie Amadeus came out, um, <laughs> you know, back in the, the, the aughts, um, <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm aware of the marriage of Figaro, um, but was not familiar with, uh, this, uh, particular aria. I know nothing about <laughs> opera. I can't oh, pronounce dear. any of these things. Um, <laughs> but I have access to Wikipedia. So this yes. is, <laughs> so I learned that this is, ta- obviously this is taken from the marriage of Figaro, uh, composed by Mozart, which I just learned it's a sequel to The Barber of Seville. I am vaguely aware of the story of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and this aria is sung by the Countess, whose husband is constantly cheating on her. Ironically, I think she's like the main figure in The Barber of Seville, and then the sequel, she's like constantly getting cheated on. It's depressing. Oh. Okay. So the translation of the lyrics are as follows. Bear in mind, I did not translate it. I do not speak Italian. I was kind of looking at going, oh, this doesn't look right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love, give me some remedy for my sorrow, for my size. Either give me back my darling or at least let me die. Can you believe that it was only a four line song and she was singing for a good like 20 minutes? This is why I don't fuck with opera. Like, we've got to be here like 17 hours to get through the story. Uh, oh, God. I can believe it because it's Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know Mozart, how I. We've got other things to do, honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how I'm always saying uh, on here like, too many notes. Um, you know, that is from the movie Amadeus and it's, you know, basically the, the, the king, I think it's the king, um, is, makes a comment about, um, uh, the music that he hears, uh, from Mozart, you know, in the, the first scene that the two of them are together. And he makes a comment that, you know, well, they're just too many notes, <laughs> Take out a few of them and then that'll be great. Um, so I think know. he should have taken that note. He should have taken that on board. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh God! So the introduction of Samuel Colborn. Okay, well, I love this actor. Um, uh-huh. Yes, he has a real air of mischief and lightheartedness about him that I think Alexander really needs in his life. Um, <laughs> I squeaked I, when I saw him come on stage. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's him. <laughs> I am confused because I've heard he's his older brother. Older brother. 
I think I watched like a PBS video. Um, they released little tiny snippets on Instagram of like the cast talking behind the scenes. And he was like, mm-hmm. Samuel Colborn is Alexander's older brother. And I was like, well, why hasn't he inherited then everything that yeah. like, oh, I'm really confused? <laughs> I'm, yeah. Maybe he just slipped up. I'm confused. Someone explain. <laughs> oh, man. And I'm looking on the uh, page with, that has the cast photos, and I'm not finding him, which is frustrating the hell out of me. Um, but uh, I do I do adore that actor. He was in um, one of my favorites, um, Pillars of the Earth. Oh, um, yeah, never which, watched it. Yeah. Oh, God, I loved that. Um, Didn't that also have... uh, Eddie Redmayne? Yeah. Anyway, um, love the introduction of um, uh, uh, Colborne number two uh, to the the show. Um, I think that he's going to present um, somewhat an opportunity to hook up with a London lawyer. I really hope him and Lady Susan are Ooh, scheming away be, together. Wouldn't that be cute? Oh, yes. Right? They seem perfect yes. for each other. I am great. intrigued by the fact or that you, they haven't seen each other in 10 years. Like, if I'm not mistaken, that's around the time Alexander got married. I wonder oh, yeah, if he, be. like, hated his wife. <laughs> like, he didn't get along. <laughs> To be oh fair, dear. she was cheating on him. Um, <laughs> oh dear. I want all the gossip. I need them to like just just give me <laughs> the deets. Um, yes. I don't have much trust in his techniques as a lawyer at the moment. Um, because mostly all I saw him do was yell at Georgiana, and I'm sort of like, okay, but other than yelling at her, what are your techniques here? Um, <laughs> what's your plan? <laughs> yeah. Although, you know, I. I totally understood why he was doing that because she needs to be aware of what's going to wind up happening and be prepared for it. Um, So, you know, initially I was like, don't yell at her. But then I was like, no, okay, you you need to yell at her a little bit. Yeah. I also like, I want both. I want him to prepare her. And also have a case, because at the moment, I feel like he's just going to wing it, and that scares me. I'm like, yeah. I would need <laughs> I would need more to go on here. I suppose she doesn't have many options, so there's that. But generally, I'm quite excited about having a trial, but we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yay, we get a trial, yay! <laughs> Storylines. <laughs> Um, I thought we'd start with Charlotte and Colborne. We haven't really mentioned them at all. Um, last week I said I wanted a little more longing and staring and stuff, and we well, definitely you, you got it, got it, <laughs> <laughs> you got I'm, it. I'm um, definitely underwhelmed by all of the awkward conversation, though. Like, I definitely I love the staring, but when they talk, a piece of me dies. <laughs> <laughs> It's so awkward. Oh, it's painfully awkward. Um, I, I c- can't yeah. watch. I have a feeling that there's going to be some defenses crumbling um, in next week's episode. Um, you know, I I don't know about you. Well, we're going to be halfway through the season. We need movement. I know, I know. <laughs> um, but uh, I know I squealed when their fingers touched oh my god so i'm gonna get cancelled for this but oh <laughs> no, no i did not I did you not. didn't <laughs> no i spent the whole scene going through the little period drama roller deck in my mind going i've seen this before i've seen this before where have i seen this before going through all the different shows i've watched and then it i was like oh I've seen this entire scene in season one of Bridgerton between Daphne and Simon. <laughs> <laughs> when they they go to the opera yes. and their hands reach out for each other. Like, yes. come on. <laughs> I've seen it. And it wasn't that long ago. Um, oh. So I couldn't 
enjoy it fully because I was just like, why are we doing this again? I know that like there's nothing original about Bridgerton and there are probably <laughs> thousands of other scenes that exist in that um that are similar to that, but after Bridgerton became like the biggest hit in the genre for some time, it's very bold of them to do such an incredibly similar scene so soon after. <laughs> Just what were they? Why? Why was that in the script and nobody said anything? Like it's just chock full of tropey goodness. But during an opera singing, just, just, <laughs> I don't. My brain broke. Oh, I want something different and original. Oh gosh, I hope they don't disappoint you this season. I just. I'm sure they won't. I just, just in that particular scene, I was like, no, <laughs> please, let's do something new here. Oh, I was also thinking about the logistics of them sitting in the chairs and like mm-hmm. that's so they're different. She's much shorter than him. I was like, there's no way their hands would be a similar <laughs> height. This is bullshit. <laughs> oh my gosh, you got way too analytical on this show. I'm always, <laughs> always in that space. <laughs> oh, God. Well, yeah, I want there to be some movement um, in a positive direction for these two. Um, you know, and I think that Charlotte is the one that's going to wind up uh, making gonna a snap. decision. Yeah, yeah. I think she's going to be the one. Was like, I really liked how... Um, supportive Carl Bourne was of Georgiana in particular because A, I'm a Georgiana stan but B, season 2 Carl Bourne was sort of painted as a bit of an asshole because he didn't get involved with things and mm-hmm. he kept his own peace and now he's sort of like getting behind all of Charlotte's little causes and I'm like that's perfect, that's perfect husband material, support <laughs> I would have enjoyed them actually, like, I when they were sat there, I was like, talk about the case. Why can't you just talk about Georgiana's trial or something? Like, have a normal pe- person conversation, but no, it was awkward and weird again. And I just, I just want them to talk. Please just talk. <laughs> <laughs> the frustration is so real. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they've really had the opportunity to, to talk. They haven't had the opportunity to be alone. Well, that's not true. They don't want to talk. They've had opportunities, but they both feel like they can't. And I'm just like, but why? Just talk. Uh, it is the constant, like, we talked about it all the time in Paul Dork. Mm-hmm. People just had a conversation. None of this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, God, if, pe- if, if it wasn't for miscommunication, um, you know, we, we wouldn't have any kind of dramas to watch. Because most of the time, it all boils down to miscommunication or lack of communication. I just can't have any more small talk. As somebody who hates small talk, <laughs> like, if we get a third episode of small talk, I will jump off the cliff <laughs> at Santon. Yeah. What do you think of the weather? You know, yeah. Rita will throw something at the television. I hope that Lady Susan and his brother just like lock them in a room together and make them talk. That's just what I want. <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, how bad are we feeling for Ralph? Because mm-hmm. he's been conveniently shuffled off screen so we don't have to think about the fact that she's potentially gonna cheat on him. Yeah. But <laughs> Yeah. I'm feeling I'm feeling really bad because dude is about to get jilted. That was a whole ass love letter he sent at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I, I was like, oh my god, man. He's in deep. Mm-hmm. And why? Because they yeah. don't have anything in common. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like as soon as he as soon as he said, you know, that he's loved her his whole life, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> uh, with, <laughs> when, yeah, when he said that in the in the first episode, it's like, oh God, this dude is just gonna get hammered. I hope that some nice lady is showing up in Willingdon and yes. sweeping him off his feet. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so Georgiana's trial 
Yes. I am here for the trial. Mm-hmm. I know I complained every time it happened on Poldark, but that was because it happened too much. Too many times, um, yes. Too many times. Ross was always guilty of what he was charged with. <laughs> this time, <laughs> I'm actually invested in the outcome. Yes. And I love it because I think it's challenging Georgiana to stand up for herself and fight for her mm-hmm. position and her status. Like It's more than just the money. It's about how she's viewed in society. Mm-hmm. And I think this character is always best when fighting an injustice. Like mm-hmm. when we saw her with the sugar boycott. By the way, so mm-hmm. many sweets in this episode. I know. I was so mad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, things haven't been sorted out yet. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Slavery, slavery is still a thing. Guys, why Why are you still... Well, you just <laughs> forgot about it? Okay. Um, uh, I think the threads that this will pull out of her backstory are really fascinating. Um, they open up a whole can of worms in terms of her mother and father. I've always been concerned about that quote-unquote relationship mm-hmm. because... There are serious issues surrounding consent, and the way she has sort of idolized her father makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, Understand it, but girl. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Interested in learning more about where she comes from, how this came to be. I'm kind of scared of her at the same time because it's going to be really tough. Mm -hmm. Um, But hopefully, the writers will ultimately make all this trauma worth it and give her her mother she needs her mother (laughs) yes she does she really needs to have someone she can call her own i i am i too am looking forward to it i'm i am very interested to find out what lockhart has up his sleeve um and you know just just how this thing is gonna go um i hope that they don't wind up giving it to Col- uh not to Colburn, uh, to Lockhart. I really do. Um, they can't. They can't unless they want an uprising. <laughs> I don't feel like they would do that to Georgiana at this point. She's everyone's fave. Yeah. They're going to give her a happy ending because it's... Yeah. If they this better. was like s- season three of five, they would yes. take away the money. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. to have her go through some struggles and give her a storyline. But because mm-hmm. this is the final season, I think she's going to get that money. But I yeah. don't understand how. <laughs> because the, the judge, the judge are racist. Um, yeah. We don't know. She literally doesn't know what the case against her is, which makes mm-hmm. arguing it impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, like, everything seems... <laughs> against her yeah maybe they're gonna be like last minute they'll produce the mother will show up at the trial and be like hello (laughs) (laughs) i have documents (laughs) i can testify or something i don't know that would be the craziest plot twist it sure would be i tell you i love a trial (laughs) (laughs) oh gotta wait until sunday okay um speaking of things i love Mm-hmm. and lord montrose yes oh my yes God. i'm now less certain that they fucked uh-huh. in the previous episode yeah but me too. i'm a hundred percent sure that they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> and they're, you know arthur is definitely a gay 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 and i yes. feel like this may be the cutest thing to ever happen on this show like yes. it's so sweet <laughs> <laughs> it is really sweet, but oh my god, talk about the the tornado <laughs> that <laughs> this whole thing is going to have on so many people. <laughs> oh my god, his mother is going to have a heart attack. Oh yeah, she's just not even going to know what to do with herself. <laughs> yeah, she deserves it though. But yeah, she does. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I love their scenes together because Arthur's like this really, he's turned into like a straight laced serious guy mm-hmm. and then Harry's like this Tasmanian devil of fun that just sort of <laughs> <laughs> spins into his orbit 
yes. being completely crazy. Yes. Showing up in the stupidest outfit. Um, <laughs> oh my god. I loved that. Oh my um, god, when he showed up with that, I was like, okay, that's hilarious. I can't believe you travel with that. <laughs> yeah, there's no way he travels with that. It's like, do you do you carry it just in case? <laughs> Pretty sure that they only ever wear that like once a year um, for the ceremony. So it's was like, yeah. like, what are you doing, I mean, man? But I mean, if you're going for pomp, yeah, he it doesn't get big guns. It doesn't get more <laughs> pompy than that. Yeah, he yeah he he did it. Um, <laughs> that was really cute. I also just loved. I can really see them being quite happy together, and I want them yeah. to kiss and just be together and be happy yeah. and like everybody leave them alone I want no homophobia from the, it, this one out just absolutely none of it Right, none they are precious and must be protected exactly mm-hmm. I don't know like how how like how this would work <laughs> he definitely needs to marry a lady for his money because mm-hmm. um, that man is broke uh-huh. So question mark about this. Maybe he could get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Shining shoes or I don't know. That that'll be a new spin-off. <laughs> Speaking of men that need to get jobs, uh, Edward oh. <laughs> and Augusta. Um Oh my gosh. Grace, Grace, Grace. I am so worried about this um as you should be yeah i'm just so worried about this because i feel like they are trying to redeem this man oh they are and i don't enjoy it <laughs> i i mm-mm, no 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 um he should be in jail like yeah. i'm sorry but he he should be in jail uh-huh. he's not even doing the menial labor he has been told to do no like he's out here not raking leaves writing uh-uh. shitty poetry and enjoying <laughs> himself and basically <sighs> lying to the reverend you know and just talking up you know all kinds of mess um you know telling him what the reverend wants to hear um, and the reverend is just eating it up, the idiot. I mean, in, in <laughs> some respect, that is his own fault because he is stupid. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely insane to believe that this man would not try and manipulate you. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's his middle name. <laughs> <laughs> what annoys me the most about this is this idea that, well, Augusta knows he's bad, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like no, no. Not really, though. How does no. that mitigate the fact that he's awful? Um, <laughs> yeah. And the, the things that he the things that he has done to uh, several women. But mostly Esther. He claimed to love Esther and then drugged her, yeah. made her think she was crazy, mm-hmm. and, um, and suggested she gets institutionalized yeah so um i hope he rots in hell yeah i don't think there's any circumstances with which i could forgive him Mm-mm. esther didn't forgive him so why should i um yeah. no i i am i'm totally with you i if they wind up through some crazy machinations that and they get those two together it's i'm not going to be happy about it at all and it'll be something that i'll remember um about the series the that show. really yeah. really well, bothered me so don't do it i just don't i mean what do does it? it say about the writers that they think that we want to see this <laughs> No, thank you. We don't want to see this man redeemed. Uh-uh. We want to see him locked up. Yep. He's awful. Yeah. Um, but I would have that, been I would have been completely happy not to have him in this season. But y'all had to get the whole revenge thing. Um He hasn't even been punished the, properly. No. 
know. It's like a cold shower once does not make up yeah. for ruining someone's life anyway. Seriously. <sighs> The, the, uh, the, on the other hand, I have to say, though, if I was Augusta, a very sheltered, like, 17, 18-year-old mm-hmm. girl, I get the appeal. Totally oh, yeah. get the appeal. Oh, you yeah. would think, oh, I could change him. Uh-huh. He's very attractive. I get He's an that. attractive bad boy. Exactly. For big fruit. And if you mm-hmm. were being paraded around like a mare in front of all these teenage boy suitors that you're not attracted to and then edward came along Mm -hmm. you would go for it i understand it i just just don't do it (laughs) just i just hate the storyline that anybody would think yes this is what viewers want to (laughs) see like absolutely i feel sick to my stomach (sighs) yeah Mm -hmm. i hate it i hate it (sighs) lots of hatred okay Let's move on <laughs> to our very cute little pair. <laughs> I was finding them cute, but now I'm also disgusted. I was like, <laughs> I was in, I was sold. Who doesn't love a second chance romance? We're all here for it. But the moment I realized he had not only lied to her about standing her up at the altar, but tried to make her think she was being forgetful. Like, oh, uh-huh. you must be. I was, yep. this is trash behavior of a <laughs> trash man. Yes. Lady Denham, steal all his money. Do not let <laughs> him use you. Yes. No. Um. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rowley and I'm a gaslighter. Oh, God. <laughs> the men on this show are either trash <laughs> or cold. <laughs> 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 Oh god. Oh lord. Um yeah, they were they were adorable there for a while, but uh um you know, I I will say the scene between Roly and Lady Denim where they're trying to con- he's trying to convince her to do this. <laughs> yeah. And just the Amazing. way that it it wound up playing out, I thought that the writing was really, really good. Um, oh, my God, yeah. F- yeah, for that scene. Um, you know, because initially she's like, no, over my dead body you'll do any And then by the end of it, she's like, you will not build it anywhere else. You're going to build it right here <laughs> by the seawall. It's like, uh-huh. <laughs> it's like classic con artist sort of manipulative behavior yes yes okay well if you don't want it i'll just go somewhere else Mm -hmm. no you won't um (laughs) reverse psychology bullshit oh my god lady denim i love her but she's very easily manipulated remember in season two when she was convinced (laughs) edward had redeemed himself Uh (laughs) yeah it's like no there there is nothing that fool can do to redeem himself. But uh but yeah, she's she can be pretty gullible. She really is. All mm-hmm. that money, I don't know. Um, yeah. As for the plan to build the hotel by the sea wall. Oh. Oh boy. I hope the fishermen have their pitchforks ready and <laughs> There's going to be a riot. Con- <laughs> con- we going to have a riot. Tom's house. They know where he lives. Um Oh my god, Mary is j- going to have his scalp. <laughs> good for her. Yeah. She was right, by the way, about yes, she is. building it on the cliff. Yep. Um, we've both been to Cornwall a lot. All mm-hmm. the grand hotels are built on the cliff side. Yeah. They don't build them in the middle of the fucking town. Mm-mm. It's going to be cramped and smelly, and the views aren't going to be as good. Mary yep. is right. Listen yep. to Mary. Yep. Plus, you know, tearing down Old Town, which you know that's where. The hotel is supposed to go. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, tearing that down. Oh, yeah. That is going to go over like a lead balloon. Mm-mm. Well, I look forward to the riot that is no t- Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely coming. <laughs> Honestly, you know, the next time we do one of these uh, shows, we need we need a bingo card. I know, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's got to mm-hmm. the point where it's just like trope. Trope, <laughs> trope. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. 
Beatrice Hawkins and Dr. Fuchs. Bizarre coupling. Mm -hmm. I love them. But he started his love letter by telling her about what I assume (laughs) is a hole through someone's chest. (laughs) I mean, that's that's insane. I love it, but I'm confused by it, you know? (laughs) Oh, God. I thought her brother hovering around to, to, to read it along with his sister. I thought that was hilarious. Um, but, uh, yeah, I am here for, um, gosh, what would their, what's their couple name? I was going to say Bukes. But that doesn't make Bukes? Sense. Yes. <laughs> Bukes. <laughs> Bukes. Yes, I'm here like for it. Bukes, but yeah. Okay. I'm here for it. They're adorable. Uh, themes. Mm-hmm. Definitely a whole vibe of women who have been let down. Yes. And this became really obvious when we got the opera singer dedicating her aria to the broken-hearted women. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking about like listing all of the jilted women in this town, <laughs> <laughs> women with broken hearts. Oh, it's man. It's a real shitty place to be if you're a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only person that's had luck is Allison. Yeah. And I mean, she... Really almost didn't. Yeah. Like, she got really lucky that she drowned. Um, yeah. A sentence I never thought I'd say. Uh, <laughs> without that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, otherwise, it's kind of not a great place to be. <laughs> Terrible place to be if you're a woman. Yes. Fantastic if you're a man that wants to manipulate a woman. But <sighs> terrible for everyone else. Um. <laughs> um class we had um uh more brushes with uh class struggle um not as many as we had in the first episode but i suspect i was very pleased for us personally for having mm-hmm. spotted this last week <laughs> being like mm-hmm. this is a thing and then they started doing the hotel building mm-hmm. shenanigans thing yes and i was like "Ooh, yep not us a- being smart um <laughs> we're observant <laughs> <laughs> you would hope so <laughs> um, i think uh unlike season one where you could try and make the case that tom was trying to improve sanditon for everyone's betterment mm-hmm. this just feels like he's being motivated by greed the town oh, yeah. is already a success it's like capacity uh, capitalism. anything now would purely be to line his pockets and the way all three of them were like we're gonna be really rich ha 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 it felt like mm-hmm. they were in some kind of b-movie villain yeah subplot, like just <laughs> purely <laughs> evil <laughs> <sighs> let's see how this goes i mm-hmm. really i can't believe i'm rooting for a <laughs> riot oh yeah <laughs> We are, oh, we, are t- we are we are team circle. <laughs> we're team power uh to the people. <laughs> oh yeah. So the visual themes mm-hmm. but I noticed a lot of love letters. Mm-hmm. Um, both Charlotte and uh Beatrice received letters this week and I loved mm-hmm. the visuals of the opening scene where yeah. you got Charlotte on the beach looking wistful um lots of shots of the letter itself with the mm-hmm. paper and the handwriting mm-hmm. beautiful yeah um, as for hands <laughs> me, oh, Christ. the hands they were everywhere um, yes <laughs> <laughs> it's become a bit of a period drama cliche too at this point with like hands reaching out for each other i think joe wright really started something with Pride and Prejudice, with the shot of the hand, like he, he created a monster. Yeah. Because Regency period dramas just love that shit now. It's it's in everything. It was that was such that was such an iconic moment. Um, you know, when you think about this genre, um, you know, when he hands her up into the carriage and she's just shocked. Um and he turns around and goes back into gloves. the house. Yeah. <laughs> turns around and goes back into the house. And as he's walking, he like 
flexes his hand and is just like, oh. <laughs> and then the dance with no gloves. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> you people are brazen. <laughs> <laughs> It is really like a sign of how incredibly uptight and repressed everyone is that like w- not wearing gloves and standing mm-hmm. closer than six feet apart and touching their hands together. Mm. <gasps> it's so incredibly erotic. Yeah. <laughs> it's <Puppy racy>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh God. But we're here we are talking about Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, okay. Uh. But like I like this visual. I just hope mm-hmm. it doesn't become too played out because I think the more you do it, the less yeah. impact it has. Yep. Like you've got to be very careful about when it happens. Um, okay. Favorite scenes. What's your favorite scene? You know, I, as hard as it was to watch, I think it was the scene where Georgiana is meeting with uh, her new lawyer for the first time. Um, because it is something that is, it is so important for her to understand, um, Mm -hmm. and be prepared for. Um, I thought it was, it was beautifully acted, um, and really helped to set the stage for, uh, Georgiana, uh, to be ready for what's coming and what's coming is not good. Um, you know, and he he picked up on some things that I had been, sort of thinking about and Mm -hmm. sort of confused about like why is she living by herself like that seems like a strange thing to do given her position like they've always made sure she was chaperoned the rest of the time yeah i mean just because she's open to yeah just because she's got her money doesn't mean that that she should be uh unchaperoned if anything, yeah. they need to double it up. I mean, I understand not wanting to live with the Hankins. Like, I get yeah. that. <laughs> but I can also... It's like things that have occurred to me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, So it wasn't like pulled out of thin air. Suddenly been like, oh yeah. So I appreciated that they have thought about things like that would be misconstrued. Mm-hmm. I bet you on the show... Okay, I don't want to trash Bridgerton, but... I'm not sure, like Bridgerton, they would just make it seem like it was normal that she was living by herself. <laughs> Is something that, because she's so young and she's of marriageable age, mm-hmm. it would be gossiped about. Yes, it, would. it just would be. Mm-hmm. Um, society is ridiculous. Yeah. How about you? What are your favorites? I loved the scene where um, Arthur's like near tears on the beach mm. and Harry approaches him. Yeah. <laughs> I Aww. thought it was really funny. <laughs> and <laughs> Arthur was just, he went full melodrama. Yes. It was like. He is such a queen. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he'd just been told his whole family had been killed. Yes. Like the look of distress. And I was like, dude, it's just a recital. <laughs> Um, and the way he was like, I cannot lie to an artiste. Yes. <laughs> was just so. Oh, he is such a so queen. Next level dramatic. Such a drama oh, queen. I love him. Yeah, I do too. I adore him. <laughs> and it's really funny because Harry is talking about like understanding the artistic temperament the whole episode. And I think Arthur thinks he's talking about miss greenhorn but he's actually talking about arthur because arthur has the most like dramatic reaction to everything like very (laughs) oh god (laughs) i love him but he's so it was just unnecessary oh he's so funny (laughs) are we really this upset about the king not coming he seems like an ass like come on (laughs) there's this really funny moment where um Arthur's trying to tell Tom that the king's not coming, and Tom keeps going, "Not now, yes, not now." Arthur keeps <laughs> talking to some random people. It's like, God, dang it! You need to listen to your brother. <laughs> Didn't you get that point so last funny. season? Hmm? <laughs> I do love this show's just commitment to Tom being a bit of a prick. <laughs> I, I I swear to God that can't have been in the script because it was <laughs> it was like 
offhand for like two seconds in the background and I saw it and died. I was just like, oh god. Okay, least favorite. Um, I don't. I mean, apart from my internal dialogue during the hand touching stuff at the recital, I don't think I have one. Okay, but. I don't know that I would choose that because that's like maybe a me problem because not everyone watches so many period dramas and they're constantly comparing them to each other. <laughs> that's definitely a, a Rita problem that I should not project on the show. Um, what about you? Oh, God. Um, you know, I, I, I can't think of any. Um, I, I completely enjoyed this episode. Um, and, uh, think that they did a marvelous job okay favorite costume for me it was definitely miss greenhorn's mm-hmm. white dress yep. for the recital yep it was so freaking glamorous yeah she reminded me so much of like an early 1920s jazz thing yes. well, i think yes it was it that was, was the vibe they were going it for. was modern <laughs> yeah yeah i guess I was also thinking, like, that's probably the earliest frame of reference for black performers that they had to draw on. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was something a bit like Bessie Smith about mm-hmm. the look. I think it was the hat with the feather yeah. and just yeah. white. I was like, S- it looked amazing. Yeah, it was beautiful. She really, like, she walked out there and you were like, oh, um, she is legit. <laughs> yes. Like, this is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They're so. Yeah, yeah, that that, it, that basically made every every other costume pale in comparison. Although I would have to give an honorable mention to Harry's get up. Oh yeah, <laughs> because it was but just I mean, so fabulous. <laughs> you can't credit the the costume department for that. That's that's an actual outfit people wear in this country. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gotta love that about England. Um, So, performer of the episode. You know, we've perpetually had uh, Rose Williams in in this um, segment, but, you know, she didn't do that much. Yeah, I felt like the past two episodes, she's taken a bit of a a step back. Yeah. I think, um, for me, Crystal Clark, Mm -hmm. who... Also didn't really get much screen time, but... um, The screen time she got, she nailed. Nailed. Mm -hmm. She was, like, going through it this week. Yeah. And she really impressed me. She's so good. She's just so damn good. And every time you remember she's American, (laughs) I hope... That just, like, blows my mind over and over again. Um... She's By so good. contrast, I thought the actress who I don't know she's actually American who played Miss Greenhorn. Her accent was really going in and out sometimes. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, maybe the American accent wasn't as strong back then. I don't know why I was trying to justify <laughs> it to myself. But like, this isn't. Oh, I I always pay too too close attention to accents. It's one of my. <sighs> It's one of the things we love about you, Rita. Just neurotic as fuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how many Antigua Black Pineapples out of five? Um, I think I would give this uh, four. It's not perfect. It was a great episode, but I'm ready to get to it. You know. I felt like it was like a tease. Mm-hmm. It was a tease for the impending drama. Right. And I'm now like, okay. We've put in the groundwork. It was a great. I want. It was a great appetizer. The drama. I yeah. need the entree now. <laughs> I would also give it a four. Again, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Give me more. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we're not greedy or anything. Nah. <laughs> totally are. I love that we're like. There's only six episodes. I know. <laughs> They've got to pack in so much. I know. Like, no, give it to me now. Give me all the things. Oh, uh, we're we're we are in for. Uh, a wild ride, I think. So, usually right about now, we would be going into our postcards from Sanditon feature, but we're afraid you're just going to have to wait because our mailbag was so damn full 
that we decided to split it off into a second podcast to be released tomorrow. So brace yourself. It's going to be a fun time. Thank you for listening. Please remember to keep an eye out tomorrow. And if you want more updates from us, as well as funny bonus content, please follow us on Twitter, on Instagram. We're in the Books Network. And, you know, please rate and review us. Please, please, please. (laughs) Wherever you get your pods. See you soon, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.